This is the installation instruction video for the extended runtime fuel tank for the Honda EU 3000 IS. The generator that I'm going to be installing the kit on today is a California emissions approved version. The instruction video here will cover the California approved version as well as the old style or 48 state. The kit will come in a box. It will contain everything except for the fuel tank itself. The reason the kit does not contain the fuel tank itself is because quite often different people will want different sized fuel tanks. But the kit will contain all the parts needed to do the installation. I'm going to break the installation down into separate tasks. So the first task will be the removal of the valve cover and modification of the valve cover. And we can go ahead and take a break. Okay, the installation of the kit is fairly straightforward. This, as you can see, is the California Emissions Approved version. You can quickly identify it by the fact that you have the two hoses going to the emissions canister. It's for vapor recovery on the fuel tank and then the return line going to the air box. The first thing we're going to do is going to be the valve cover modification. It is not critical to remove this rubber gasket. I only remove it to keep it from getting any nicks or scratches. In order to remove the valve cover, you'll first have to remove this rear panel. The rear cover is held on by four 10 millimeter acorn nuts. Generally, the acorn nuts will come off easily. Occasionally, you'll get one where the stud sticks to the acorn nut, which is what feels like is happening here. And I'll show you how to deal with that real quickly. So we've unscrewed the stud from the back of the cabinet. You'll see the stud came off with the acorn nut. What we do? Put a 10 millimeter wrench on the hex on the stud. And then we unscrew the acorn nut from it. I'm going to go ahead and leave that stud off. When you get the cabinet off, make certain that the foam is in this groove all the way around the cabinet. If the foam pops out, it'll look kind of like that. And simply tuck it back into the groove. And there are four metal inserts also that go into the back of the cover check to make sure that all four of the metal inserts are in place. And if they're not, put them in and be careful that they don't fall when you're working on the cabinet later on. The next step is to remove this lower cover shield. And the lower cover shield is held on with four six millimeter bolts. And these bolts are painted black. The reason for it is strictly cosmetic, so if you set these bolts along with the cover separate, you'll make sure and keep the black bolts going into the black cover.
The next step is to remove the exhaust grill, and that's held on with four more six millimeter bolts. The exact same size as the ones that held this lower cover on. These are chrome though, and that's why I stated earlier to go ahead and keep them separated. is held on with four 12 millimeter bolts. emissions canister right here in the corner. On the non-California approved model, there is no emissions canister, so there's nothing to concern yourself over. We're going to remove the heat shield, and that is simply slide it out and spread the corners where they'll go out around the motor mounts. On the non-California approved model, this area here is filled in very much like this. The California approved model is simply cut out to go around the emissions canister. I'm going to go ahead and remove the bracket that holds the emissions canister in place. It's not critical that you do this. I'm going to do it on the video here because it's easier to see what I'm doing. purpose of this video, it'll help a lot if you're able to see exactly what I'm doing. If you do decide to remove the emissions canister, it's held on with two more 6 millimeter bolts, identical to the ones that held the grill in place. I'm simply just going to set it off the side. I'll put the bolts with the other frame ones. And that's as good a place as I need to take a break for a moment. Okay. The next step to the removal of the valve cover. It's going to be to remove the breather hose. And that's this hose. It goes on the corner of the air box. And the other end slides into the valve cover. And here's the hose. And we'll set this aside temporarily too. The valve cover itself is held on with four six millimeter bolts. Two of them are reached through this window here.
The other two are undone from the outside here. They are unique because they go into a blind hole in an aluminum casting. They are tapered on the tip just slightly. All the other bolts that you have dealt with come to an abrupt end. But the valve cover bolts are slightly longer and they're tapered at the tip. Remove the valve cover easier if you go ahead and remove the spark plug cap and just let it hang out this window and that will pop the valve cover loose from the cylinder head and it has to be spun counterclockwise and pulled out. Now there is a gasket on this generator it's stuck to the cylinder head which is rather convenient. The kit comes with a new valve cover gasket if the original valve cover gasket gets torn in any way, use the new gasket. If not, you can save the new gasket for when you're doing valve adjustments later on. This is a California approved kit, or excuse me, a California approved generator. You notice the valve cover area on this one has a plate for the breather cover. Let me show you the difference. This is the non-California approved. So if you've got the type with the purge tank and the extra hoses along the side, you'll have this valve cover. If you've got a 48 state or old style, you'll have this valve cover. And that's probably as good a place as any to take a break for a moment. Okay, I'm going to do the California approved valve cover first. I'll go ahead and do them separately. California approved versus the 58 state or 48 state. We need to remove the breather plate from the valve cover. And this is more of an art than a science. What I would do is get a flat, solid surface and just tap the valve cover straight down on it a couple of times to see if you can get a gap between the breather and the valve cover. And you'll notice we now have a gap. I can slide a flat blade screwdriver into and just gently work this the rest of the way out. And you don't want to pry real hard in any one spot. You don't want to bend it. And now you have your breather removed from the valve cover. This hole is simply a reed valve. In order for this fuel kit to work properly, we need to remove this reed valve from this area and install a new reed valve further down the line because we want to be able to take advantage of the pulse wave in the crankcases and use that to drive the fuel pump that's included in the kit. Go ahead and take a break for a moment. Okay, the easiest way to open this reed valve, take a pair of needle nose pliers and take the reed stop and just bend it up a little bit so you've got some clearance to work. You'll notice now that the reed stop sticks up higher than the breather hose stop. And now we're going to take the reed valve itself with a pair of needle nose pliers and we're going to bend it pretty fiercely to where it stays open. You see that's now kicked open and this hole is no longer blocked. Now we can take the reed stop and push it back shut just a little bit. We were simply pushing it out of the way so that we would have room 
to bend this reed valve. Now we can reassemble the valve cover and keep in mind this is a positive crankcase ventilation valve and we're going to install a new one external to the valve cover. Just going to push the breather cover or breather plate back into place on the valve cover. This one went all the way in very nicely. If not, just tap it with a plastic screwdriver handle and it's solid and ready to go back together. We'll go ahead and take a break for a moment and then we'll come back and do the non-California version of the valve cover. Okay, this is the non-California approved valve cover. As you can see, we've got the modified California valve cover here. The non-California approved has a larger PCV valve in the top and it's not as deep a casing. The modification starts the same way. What I do is I just try to smack it on a flat surface. If it doesn't pop out immediately, don't keep beating on it because you don't want to bend the tabs because this is a gasket surface, remember. So you try to hit it down totally flat. You don't want to hit any corner first and see if it shocks it loose. And this time it did not do anything. So we're going to do this one the more hard way, a more difficult way. Start with a small screwdriver and just try to get this to come loose. And you can hear it catching just a little bit of valve cover as we go. It's just starting to come up. And don't get in too big a hurry. Okay, now we're getting enough area, but I'm going to switch to the slightly larger screwdriver. Just start easing it up with that. Okay. Now you can see that the non-California approved version is quite a bit different than the California version. The reed valve on this one is a plastic disc and it is not held closed with a spring. It simply flops back and forth. So in order to disable this valve, what we're going to do is slide a small screwdriver between the plastic disc and the metal housing because you notice that the backup retainer for this is spot welded in place. We're going to turn the screwdriver to crack that plastic disc and slide it out in sections and it is a perfectly round disc. Here's one that I removed earlier. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our screwdriver slide it in here and just turn and crack that disc.
that disc <coughs> is fairly fragile. <coughs> so the pieces will come out. It's not too difficult to crack. And simply make certain that all the pieces are out. And that's pretty straightforward and easy. Now if When you pulled it out, you roughened up this surface. Take a steel cert or like a hammer or something, and a small hammer, and just tap on this edge to clean it up a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> what I'm doing is setting it on a flat surface and just making sure that it's not bowed so it doesn't rock at all. And now, your non-California approved version is ready to go ahead and put back together. And again, simply push it back, back into place. And if it doesn't sit all the way down, take a screwdriver handle just start tapping it in. And there is your non-California approved valve cover ready to go back to reassembly. We'll go ahead and take a break. Okay, like I said earlier, this one is the California approved, so we'll be replacing the California approved version of the valve cover. The kits come with a replacement valve cover gasket to make it easier, and notice I did not say make it easy, but easier, because it's not real simple. Put a little bit of grease on the valve cover, and you'll see that Honda also used grease on the valve cover. There's some still sticking to it. To help hold the valve cover gasket to the cover, and you'll notice that there's a slight notch on this side of the valve cover. When the valve cover gasket is put in there, you'll be able to see that there's a little bit of valve cover gasket. And on this side, if you lean it back, you'll be able to shine a flashlight in and see that the valve cover and the valve cover gasket are mated properly. This particular valve cover, when I took it apart, has stayed in perfect condition. That's a very rare feat. To install the valve cover, again, remember, you have to put it in the opposite of you took it out. So slide it in and then rotate it slowly, clockwise, and push it into place. Now if you come over here, you'll see that groove that I spoke about. And you can see the valve cover gasket just peeking out from the groove. And if you come around to this side and pull it back just a little bit, you'll be seeing the valve cover gasket right here. So at this point, you know that the gasket is in place correctly. If the valve cover is not in place correctly, you'll have to do it over because that is important. When you put your valve cover back on, make sure to use the same four screws with the tapered tip that held it on originally.
Now if you look around it, right in here, you'll be able to see that the valve cover gasket is still visible. The next thing I'm going to do is put the emissions canister back in its original location. Like I said earlier, you do not have to remove the emissions canister during the normal installation. The only reason I removed this was to make it easier to videotape so you can see what I was doing. And this is simply held on with the same two screws that you took out. I need to take a break for a moment. Now we're ready to start reassembling the back half of the cabinet. This is the heat shield. The only thing tricky about this is this corner, and if you've got a non-California approved, this corner, you have to spread the edges to go over the motor mounts. Okay, when you've got this in place, you'll want to look at the bottom. See there are two metal tabs. The heat shield goes behind the two metal tabs. And then it fits neatly inside the studs all the way around. Once the heat shield is in place, I know it seems counterintuitive, but the lift handle has to go on before the grill. And you'll see why in a minute. So we'll hold the lift handle in place. And I put the two outer bolts in place first. It just makes life easier. gets held on with the chrome 6 millimeter screws where the lower cover is held on with the black ones.
put the lower shield in place. If yours is a California approved model, there is a hose coming out of the bottom of the emissions canister. It goes through the hole in the lower plate. If yours is an older style or a non-California approved, there is no emission tank canister, there is no hose, and there is no hole for it. So you don't have to worry about that part. install the stud and it's got a 10 millimeter hex on it so you just use a deep well socket and screw the stud into the hole where it goes. Nice and snug this time so it doesn't come off on them. The rear cover, once again check to make sure that all four of the metal inserts are in place and that the foam gasket that goes all the way around the edge is in place. And simply slide the cover on. Once the cover's in place, it's held on by four acorn nuts and the same four that you took off. as good a place as any to take a break from that. Okay, that actually concludes the most difficult part of the installation. Uh, the next part, you notice this is a brand new unit. It hasn't even had oil put in it yet. But the next part is going to be to put the fuel inlet port in the front of the generator. I'd like you to notice where the gas or the uh, plastic cover comes across here. It's just barely above the fins, right in front of the uh, inverter area. That'll be important later. The front cover comes off with four acorn nuts, just like the rear cover. And incidentally, sometimes the studs will stick on the front covers also. This time, that did not happen. Pop the front cover off. Check to make sure that your four metal spacers are still in place, and they are. And then check the gasket, the foam gasket that goes into this groove. And it has started to come out at the top. And it has come completely out at this side. So we simply just push it back into the groove, just a little bit of light fingertip pressure, and we'll set the front cover aside. Right here is where we're going to be mounting the uh, fuel inlet fitting. I want it to end up between the inverter unit and the battery and the fuel inlet hose is going to go right around this corner and then under the air box. So what we're going to do
going to do is we're going to remove this cover. You notice the battery has not been connected on this generator yet. I won't go into the battery connections because that's covered in the service manual or owner's manual that comes complete with the generator when you purchase it from Honda. And I wouldn't want to say anything that contradicts what Honda said. You know how that is. You'll notice that the acorn nuts that hold the lower steel panel on have a smaller flange than the ones that held the plastic cover on. So you don't want to mix and match. What you need to do is make a mark in the front cover from left to right, right even with this gap here, and from top to bottom, even with the second fin from the top. I use an automatic center punch to do this with. You can use a magic marker and then later a standard center punch to mark the hole or whatever is most comfortable for you. But now I have my mark where I'll be drilling my hole. That's probably as good a place as any to take a break for just a moment. Okay, I'm going to start out by drilling just a 1 8 pilot hole right here at the mark I made. And I'll just use progressively larger drill bits. Ultimately, I'll use a step drill. If you don't have a step drill, I do not recommend going out buying one because they're uh, grossly overpriced. Ultimately, the hole that you're drilling will be to put a quarter pipe thread through, which is just slightly larger than a half inch. So if you've got standard drills, drill it ultimately to a one half inch hole. almost to size. Now what I'm going to do is take a repairman's reamer and ream it out to the finished size. I use a repairman's reamer for two reasons. Number one, it'll take it to the, just the size I want. And number two, it cleans up the burrs that are left by the drill bit. Now you can either use a round file or a repairman's reamer or whatever to take it out the last bit because ultimately a quarter pipe fitting is just slightly larger than a half inch drill bit. So if you drill it to a half inch drill, you'll end up taking it just a little bit larger. whole size that you want. Okay. Go 
go ahead and take a break for a moment. Okay. If you look, you notice the repairman's reamer does a real nice job of cleaning up any burrs left by the drill bit. This would be the front side of the panel. And this would be the back side of the panel. This is the quick disconnect fitting. It's going to go in place. It's going to screw in to a quarter inch hose barb. And you'll notice that the quarter inch hose barb, as it screws onto the fitting, has just a slight bit of gap. And that's going to close down and pinch this panel. Now, this one is really dicey because you'll see the size of the gap. If the gap is much larger than this, I would say definitely put the washer in there to shim it. If it's smaller than this, definitely don't put the washer. When they're this size, man, it's a toss-up. I'm going to go ahead and start with the washer. And when I put the washer in place right here, the fitting will go through from the front. Incidentally, the washer is included with the kit for just this purpose because it is a pipe thread and pipe threads are tapered so you notice that there's a little bit of play before it starts to tighten down so included in the kit is a roll of Teflon tape take the Teflon tape and wrap it around the threads of the quick disconnect fitting being careful not to overlap the end because if you overlap the end you create a small piece of tape that can easily be torn loose and get lodged somewhere in the fuel system and by somewhere with my luck that usually means wherever it will do the most harm but wrap several layers of the Teflon tape around the threads. By that I mean at least three layers. Fit it through the panel. And I'm going to go ahead and put the washer in place. When I tighten it down, if it crimps on this washer, before I feel a lot of pull on the threads, I'll end up taking it apart, removing the washer, and putting it together just around this panel. Because I do not want any fuel leaks. Ultimately, I want the fitting to point this direction, which will be away from the battery. The battery is on this side of the generator, the inverter is on this side, so I want the fuel hose to come on from this side. No particular reason, I just do. So if you would prefer the fuel to fit on from this side, simply point the fitting this direction. You cannot point it straight down, because when the generator sits on the ground, you won't be able to hook your fuel hose on. And you can't point it straight up because the plastic cover sticks out quite a bit over this. And now we're going to go ahead and start tightening these fittings down. And I don't like it. So I'm going to pull it apart. Put fresh Teflon tape on it and remove the washer. The reason is I just barely got a quarter of a turn on biting the threads good before it's already tight around this panel. So I'm going to disassemble it, remove the washer, and start again. And this is one of those areas where do not get in a hurry. run into the same situation 
and it just doesn't feel right, start over. It only takes a couple minutes at this point in the game to fix it. Or if you put the whole thing together and then it has any fuel leak whatsoever, you'll be frustrated because it'll take longer to take it apart. Let's go ahead and take a break while I clean the threads up. Okay. Ready for the second attempt on this. Put fresh Teflon tape on the threads. As I stated earlier, I like the fuel fitting to point toward the inverter side. Okay, now I'm feeling it starting to bite pretty good. And it's still not quite tight around the panel, so that's going to work out well. I'm just lining it up so it's parallel to the ground when it does bite against the panel. Okay, so when you're done, you have the quick disconnect on the outside of the generator and the hose barb on the inside. At this point, we can put this panel back on. And keep in mind, we use the four nuts with the smaller flange. lid and that's simply done by opening up the four snaps remove the cover then remove the air filter element the air box itself is held in place by one bolt in the bottom corner and then two nuts that go straight through to the studs to hold the carburetor in place. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the air box now. this way off of the studs. This hose that goes from the emissions canister is tucked in to a hole in the back of the air box. So I'll unplug this hose. It's now undone. When I slide the air box off the stud, You'll see that this hose is held in two little clips 
in the back of the airbox. Note where the clips go in. We're going to go ahead and remove those. And it just pops out of them. So we can remove the airbox itself. And that hose was held in this clip and in this clip. This one is not used. If you look right below the recoil start housing, there's a wiring harness with a ferrite core around it and then foam wrapped around that. We're going to lift that up just slightly and the fuel line is going to run under it. We're going to lift it up like this. We're going to put the fuel line It goes to this fitting underneath the ferrite core. So what we'll do is include it in the kit. There are several feet of fuel hose. We're going to cut off a section of it at 19 inches long. This hose will have to be trimmed to the exact length later on, but I start with it 19 inches. You'll see the wiring harness right here with the foam and the ferrite core. I'm going to lift up on it and I'm going to slide the fuel hose underneath that. Then also included in the kit is a piece of braided plastic tubing and all that is is a guard to go around the fuel hose because if you look there's already a rubber shield right on the edge of the heat shield that keeps chafing down but just to be a little extra cautious we're going to push this braided hose to where it also protects the fuel line where it goes past the heat shield and that's simply just an abundance of precaution now we're going to take this hose and slide it on over the end of the uh, hose barb I'm going to take the hose and I'm, I'm going to dip the end of it in just a little bit of oil because it's a whole lot easier to get this one in place if you dip the end of it in oil. see that hose is now slid onto the hose barb that goes on the quick disconnect fitting in the front of the generator. And if you come around this way, you'll see that the fuel line is running underneath the foam and ferrite core. And right now it's just sticking back like this, and that's fine at this point. take one of the large hose clamps included in the kit and put it on the inlet hose. You'll see where the fuel line is protected by this piece of braided hose and it's underneath the wiring harness and the ferrite core. We're going to run this underneath this motor mount.
So now, if you look in here, you can clearly see that the fuel line, see the braided core back here is moving, and it runs underneath the motor mount. And then we're going to fit it underneath this wiring harness that runs right through here. I'll go ahead and run it under the wiring harness now. If you look in here, this fuel line is running along the very bottom of the generator. It runs past the heat shield, underneath the motor mount, underneath the wiring harness. Come around to the front, make sure that the braided plastic hose is still running, protecting it from the heat shield. At this point, we can put the front cover on. First step is to make sure that the four spacers are still in place and then make sure that the foam gasket is still in its proper place. And we're going to use the four acorn nuts with the large flanges to go ahead and hold the front cover on. extra hose sticking out this end. Like I say, trim it to at least 19 inches. That way you'll have plenty of slack hanging out. We're going to trim it to the exact size later on. That's probably as good a place as any to take a break. Okay, the next step is going to be the mounting of the fuel pump. Like I said earlier, this is a California approved model and it's identified by these two hoses that are running through here. On the California approved model, we're going to mount the fuel pump so that both holes or in a straight line vertically. Take this hose, move it out of the clip, and just tuck it out of the way somewhere. We're going to slide the fuel pump down. Let me show you something real quick. This notch right here in the fuel pump, we're going to slide it up into place where it fits right by this welded bracket that holds this retainer. So it's going to slide right up here, and we want to slide it as high and as far to the right as possible. And that's where it hits on that weld. And we'll drill a hole for the top bolt, or the top screw. If it were a non-California approved model, this retainer bracket would not be here. This retainer bracket would not be here. You would tilt the fuel pump approximately like this, and then slide it as high as possible, right in this position, and then you would be able to put screws in both holes. For the California approved model, you won't be able to drill a hole through for the bottom screw unless you were to drill through the outer housing. If you choose to drill through the outer housing, that's your choice. What I recommend doing, holding the fuel pump in place, marking the top hole, and holding the fuel pump in place with the single screw in the top hole. By the time you get all the hoses on, it's not going anywhere. So I'm going to take my punch and mark exactly where I'm drilling the hole. punch mark is. It's very faint. I'm going to go ahead and drill a 1 8 inch hole. The key 
kit will come with two three-quarter inch long screws for mounting of the fuel pump. On the California approved models like this one, only one of them will be used. We'll go ahead and run the screw into the hole. It is a sheet metal screw, so it's going to cut its own threads. Just work the screw in back and forth so it can cut the threads. Once it starts to bite in, that's good enough. You can go ahead and pull it out. Then I'm going to cut another section of hose. This will go on the out, or excuse me, that's the output port of the pump. This is the pulse port of the pump. And this is the input port on the pump. This is an inlet port for the fuel. And then coming from the fuel selector valve is the other inlet port for the fuel. So these two lines are ultimately going to tee up and then run into the input port. Right now, we're going to make up a fuel line for the output port on the generator. We're going to go ahead and cut this section of hose seven inches long on the non-California approved. Cut it at nine inches long and you'll see why in a minute. But we're working on the California version. I'll just touch on that real quickly. On the non-California version the fuel pump is mounted like this so that the output port is pointed backwards and you need a longer hose to come around. On the California approved version, it's pointed downwards at an angle so it doesn't need to be quite as long. So like I say, we're working on a California approved version. I'm going to cut this hose at 7 inches. If I dip the end of the hose in just a little bit of oil first, it makes life a lot easier to get this section clamped in place. So I've got the hose on, and I'm going to go ahead and put a hose clamp on. This hose clamp, I'm going to put the clasping portion facing out because if I put the clasping por portion facing back, the clasp will hit the heat shield and kind of push the uh, fuel pump away. So I'm going to go ahead and clamp this on. Now when the fuel pump is bolted in place, this hose will curve around and go into the fuel filter. This is the fuel filter. You'll notice that the fuel filters that I send out have a double barb, one for quarter hose, one for five sixteenths hose. We're using quarter inch fuel lines, so we're going to use the end barb. I'm going to get just a little bit of oil on the hose. Again, make life easier to assemble it. I'm going to take another large hose clamp, and this hose clamp. I want to face toward the generator. So it's going to bolt on like this, in this position. And I want the clasp of this hose to face the generator itself. Because it's going to rest right here against the heat shield. And you'll see that there's a sharp edge on this heat shield. And with this hose clasp hitting the flat portion of the heat shield, it makes certain that the hose does not come anywhere near the sharp edge. So now the fuel pump is going to mount approximately like this. And this is probably as good a place as any to take a break for a moment. Okay, at this point we're ready to start connecting the dots. What I'm going to do is I'm going to slide the fuel pump in so it's just like this, 
and we'll put a screw into the mounting hole. I'm going to do the top mounting hole. If this were the non-California approved, of course you do the top one first and then you do the second hole later. These two hoses, one is float bowl drain, the other is float vent. I'm going to move these two hoses out of the way temporarily so we can put the fuel filter in place. If you'll look, you'll see that the fuel filter and the output line right down here, the hose clamp is keeping the hose off of this metal shield so that there's no chance. If you come around here, I think you can see it a little better. There's no chance of this sharp edge coming in contact with the hose. That's the whole reason why I put this clamp on with the clasping portion, portion facing towards the generator. Okay. The kit comes with a section of 3 16 hose. It's 21 inches now. We're going to cut it. So we've got a 16 inch section and a 5 inch section. I'm going to take the 16 inch section and again I'm just going to dip the end of it in a little bit of oil. And you don't have to dip any of these hoses in oil. It just makes it a lot easier. and I've hooked it on to the output side of the fuel filter. Like I say, you don't have to use the oil, but I strongly recommend it. Now I'm going to take one of the small hose clamps included in the kit. As a rule of thumb, the smaller hoses or 3 16 hoses get the smaller hose clamps, the quarter hoses get the larger hose clamps. As difficult as that hose is to get it on the filter, it would quite possibly be just fine with no clamp, but I don't want to risk it. So this is the output hose and it ultimately goes to the carburetor. So now if you look back in here, you'll see that there's a short section of hose going from the fuel selector valve to the carburetor at this time. We're going to go ahead and remove that hose. And there are two Corbin clamps. You can call them spring type clamps or whatever name you'd like to call them. But you simply squeeze the two tabs and slide the clamps over. And this is the stock section of hose. Probably as good a place as any to take a break just for a moment. Okay, next step, we're going to take the 3 16 hose and we're going to pass it underneath this wiring harness 
that's held in place by the zip tie against the bottom frame of the generator. Then we're going to take the original quarter inch hose that came from the quick disconnect in front and make sure that that's routed over the top. So if you get your light, you'll see that the hose comes from the output port on the fuel pump and with this clamp to keep it off of the cover goes to the filter then comes out of the filter as a 3 16 hose the 3 16 hose passes underneath this wire harness it then runs around and I'm going to hook this end to the carburetor next and it will incidentally go behind the emissions hose because the emissions hose is snapped into place in two keepers on the back of the airbox. Okay, this is a small hose, 3 16 so again, it gets a small hose from it. see in there. This hose will be in this position and here's the hose, the 3 16 hose we just installed that goes into the carburetor. So now we're going to run a hose from the fuel selector valve and it'll be a 3 16 hose. It'll come down to an adapter that will adapt from 3 16 to quarter. Then it will come to a T-connector which will connect the quarter inch hose that goes to the front and run that to the input fitting on the fuel pump. I'm going to start with the quarter inch T-connector. then going to cut a piece of hose five inches long. It will probably need to be trimmed to four and a half or possibly even four later. But I'm going to cut a five and a half, excuse me, five inch long section. And that goes on to the T-fitting. Put just a little bit of oil on it. Like I say, if you choose not to use the oil, it's up to you entirely. Then I'm going to put a hose clamp on it. I'm going to put the hose clamp so it faces this away from you, as you can see. And that's simply to give me more room to work later on. I'm going to take the 3 16 inch hose, 5 inch long section that was left off from when we cut the original 3 16 inch hose. 21 inches of it came in the kit, so we clipped it as a 16 inch section and a 5 inch section. We're going to put this 5 inch section on the end of the fuel selector valve. And 
a small hose clamp. Then we're going to have to adapt from 3 16 to quarter hose. The kit comes with an adapter. Put a little bit of oil on the fitting. Push it into the 3 16 hose. Take a small hose clamp that's included in the kit. I'm going to clamp it so that the clasping portion of the clamp is facing out. The reason is because this is going to be tucked back behind this stay for the air box. Now I'm going to go ahead and hook a section of quarter inch hose onto the other end of the adapter. As you see, we got plenty of quarter inch hose left still. I'm just going to install the entire section onto it because we will cut it to fit at a later date. Now, I'm going to put the large hose clamp onto this side of the adapter. Go ahead and squeeze that shut. And that's probably as good a place as any to take a break for right now. This is the quarter inch hose. It's got the 3 16 adapter on it. It goes to 3 16 I'm going to measure 12 inches down from the connector and cut the hose right here. Now, I'm going to take the hose I'm going to route it underneath this wiring harness, but above the 3 16 hose that went from the filter to the carburetor. And now I'm going to take the connector, 3 16 to a quarter, and tuck it behind the airbox bracket. See, so you look at this now. You'll see this is the 3 16 hose that goes from the fuel filter to the carburetor. This is the 3 16 hose that comes from the fuel selector valve and our 3 16 to quarter adapter is hidden right behind the airbox mount bracket. And then this, on top of it all, is the original emissions hose that goes from the vapor canister to the fuel tank, and it'll be snapped into the two tabs in the back of the airbox. The quarter hose that goes from the quarter to 3 16 adapter hidden behind this comes down, goes underneath the wiring harness, and is going to curve around and point towards the back of the generator. This is the quarter inch hose that goes to the connector in the front. It was routed under the uh, motor mount. So now we're going to take the T connector 
with the five inch section of hose that we fitted up earlier. We're going to run it upside down so that the center T faces down and that's going to connect to the quarter inch hose that the opposite end of it connects to this. And that hose is about two inches longer than we need it to be. So I'm going to go ahead and trim two inches off the end of that. Then this hose is the one that goes to the 3 16 adapter and it's going to curve right around and hook in to the front of this T-connector. Let me just check it for length. I'm going to say that that's about an inch and a half to two inches too long also. That's the one that we trimmed to 12 inches. Keep in mind it's always easier to trim them shorter than it is to try and stretch them to length. So that's why I recommend cutting them long. And then if they need to be trimmed, that's easy to do. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and dip both of these two ends in just a little bit of oil. And like I say, if you don't want to use the oil, you don't have to. It just makes it easier to assemble for old people like me. Okay, so now we have all three hoses to the connector and I'm going to put hose clamps on this and this location and again I'm going to have the hose clamps with the clasping portion facing out. And go ahead and tuck the hose back into place again. Just make sure that nothing is rubbing against any large pieces of metal or any anything that can cut it. Okay, and again this piece of hose that was five inches long, looking at this I'm going to say that I need to trim this off a little bit too, because I want the hose that comes under the engine mount and so forth to come straight back, and I want the one that goes from the 3 16 adapter to run around in a nice gentle loop. So as you can see, this hose here ends up being about an inch and a quarter too long for the way I'm setting this one up. Excuse me, I'm going to say it's about an inch too long. So I'm going to trim one inch off of that. And I'll go ahead and dip the end of that hose. A little bit of oil.
and I'll connect it to the output port on the fuel pump. This port is the output on the fuel, or excuse me, the input on the fuel pump, I'm sorry. Goes to this port on the fuel pump. And now I'm going to put a large hose clamp in this location. And that's probably as good a place as any to go ahead and take a break. Okay. We take the last section of quarter inch hose we have left. Happens to be 22 inches long. We're going to dip the end of it in a little bit of oil. And I'm going to connect it to the pulse line on the carburetor or on the uh, fuel pump which is the final port and it's the one that aligns with this gold screen area Now I'm taking it and I'm tucking it right in along this area underneath this fuel line. Then I'm just going to route it straight up this back just for the time being, just so it's out of the way. Okay, somewhat out of the way. Good news is we are uh, we're on the white flag lap. Make sure that none of the hoses are pinched or anything like that. What we're going to do is tuck this hose, which is the emissions canister hose, into the clips on the back of the air box, and then we'll slide the air box in place. And remember, it used this clip and this clip. This one is not used. And if you look, you'll be able to see marks on the hose exactly where it used to be clipped in at. Makes it a little bit easier. I just want to shine the flashlight or the work light back in here just to make sure that none of the hoses are pinched or anything like that. Okay. Now I'm going to bolt the air box in place. The very bottom back corner where the bolt goes. Then on the two studs, you get the six millimeter nuts.
it's starting to get just a little tighter in there. I'm going to go ahead and put the air filter back in place. And I'll slide the lid back on the air box. Now I'm going to take this hose, which goes to the emission canister, clip it back into its bracket. You notice it runs just over the top of the air, or excuse me, over the top of the fuel pump. This slides into a hole in the back of the air box, the same one you removed it from earlier on. And again, if you look, there's a, a crease in this hose left over from where it was originally at when we disassembled it. Okay, we're going to take this hose, which is the one we just hooked up to the pulse port on the fuel pump, and it's going to run behind this section of the wiring harness and run straight up the edge of this foam. behind the wiring harness here and it runs right up the edge of this foam. Do not allow it to cover this little latch. This is where the door latch over here locks into. So you don't want this hose to get in the way of that. And now for the fun part. The last key piece of the peak or the kit. This hose is going to fit through this hole in the heat shield where the original breather line went through and then tuck in to the valve cover itself. So first I'm going to dip the end of this in just a little bit of oil. Again, it makes it a lot easier on me. As you can see, it's now through the heat shield. Incidentally, the spark plug wire lays below it, and then it wraps over it and hooks onto the spark plug. So then we're going to pull this the rest of the way through. And plug it in to the breather port on the top of the valve cover. And we'll take the spark plug lead and plug that back on. This now routes up and is going to connect on this to this extra piece of hose. So even with all the 
excess amounts of hose that I had when we trim this off. Talk about cutting it close. We're only going to wind up with about two and a half inches of extra hose. But again, we've got all sorts of scraps that we trimmed off earlier. Cut about two inches off the end of this. Let's see how that looks. tucks back in here. Now we take the stock breather tube and it's going to slide this end right back over where it came from. On that fitting on the air box. And this end will hook right onto here. At this point, look it all over. The kit comes with about 10 small zip ties that you can tie things into place if you should choose, or if you happen to have cut any of the original zip ties that were stock on the generator and you'd like to replace them now, you can use the zip ties that are included in the kit. seal back in place. got the, <coughs> the spark plug cover. Go back over this. <coughs> then we have the decal with the operational instructions just in case you forget how to operate it, or if the person operating the generator is not the same person that installed the kit. Like I said, extra hose clamps that you won't be using, and then extra small hose clamps. The quick disconnect fitting that you would screw into your fuel tank. The valve cover gasket that we ended up not needing. The extra zip ties. And the fuel line, genuine Yamaha, 10 foot long fuel hose with the prime bulb in it. All that's left to do now is to add oil. We'll take it outside and run it for a few hours, and that should just about do it. 